Only closing at 25 hundredths of a foot per second. And that's 15 hundredths of a mile per hour. They can be off by about a foot laterally. Houston gum drop, uh, what time is that? Uh, it's 99.15, uh, Gumdrop. Okay, we got about uh, 25 minutes. That's affirmative. I just can't even see the coast, Dave. I don't know exactly where you are with respect to it. Okay, you want me to do it? Uh, let me uh, work my way in here a little closer. Okay. Neither of the pilots can actually see the, the docking probe and the drogue, the funnel-like device on the lunar module as they get to touching range. At that point, they're aimed, as Scotty McLeod was telling us a moment ago, through the reticle on the window on, the, on a target. There's a funnel-like device there in that center portion of the lunar module uh, called the drogue. Uh, it's a couple of feet across. The probe can, on the command module, can miss the center by about a foot and still be guided into the latching position. The closing rate uh, is, maximum closing rate uh, is around four or five miles an hour, but they wouldn't want to get anywhere near that for fear of damaging the probe itself or actually one of the spacecraft. This is being done by little blips on the reaction control engines for quads of jets at four spots around the lunar module. 100 pounds of thrust in each of those jets. They control the attitude of the spacecraft and can move it forward or back. Scotty, what is it that they can't see? Water, I'm afraid I can't answer that. I am not sure what they can't see. They're looking through that coass uh, that looks like this, as I was demonstrating before. They have a gun sight that is projected through this onto the overhead hatch. It might be that he can't clearly see the target that is in the command module. Apparently, that's what he said he couldn't uh, see is the coass. I guess that's what he means. Huh? The, that's the crewman's op optical alignment sight. So yes, right. that's correct. All right. David Scott's kind of guiding him in. He keeps telling him he's fine. Right there. Oh, that doesn't look like it's for me. So you're going to come in from an angle anyway, so you're doing good. The yaw's off about two degrees. A little like a neighbor helping his neighbor get his car parked in the garage. Dave's I just can't of. see the darn collapse. I can't tell what my attitude is. I think you got a handle on it now. But it keeps disappearing. 
Okay, now you're looking pretty good. Okay, I'm lined up uh, in translation, but I can't tell what my attitude is, Dave. If, I'm not, if I don't see it, well, there it is, there. Now you're coming in. That's good, looking better. There you go. I think you've got a handle on it now. But it keeps disappearing. Okay, now you're looking pretty good. Inside the capture boundary would mean the probe and the drogue are lined okay. up. been suggested it may be the glare of the sunlight that's making it difficult for it. It's really sporty. It sure is. I can tell. And give it a good. to see the, uh, give it particularly to see the optical alignment there, the target. Keep it coming. Okay, why don't you do it? I can't tell where it is. We're free now. Good show, Spider. Roger, uh, onboard fuel reading 65 and 65. The simulation is a little behind here. 55. We've had the confirmation that they have touched. Uh, Roger, reading 55, 55. Thank you, uh, Rusty. Retract. They are, have the soft dock and they're retracting, which means they will be firing a nitrogen bottle. Like that in a long time. That was a very nice docking. That, that, that wasn't a docking, that was a high test. Okay, Houston, we're locked up. Well, it sounds like you passed it 2010, uh, Jim. That sounded real beautiful. Good show. What a beautiful flight and what a beautiful maneuver that turned out to be. They are docked. They are locked up. They will re now repressurize. And uh, after they have turned off the lights, so to speak, McDivitt and Schweikert will leave this spacecraft, which has proved out remarkably well in its okay, very sir, first I'm test. Free and, uh, you're in free. I'm going to proceed into the tunnel here when I get spread away. Divot and Schweiker. That was Jim McDivitt. Hard day's work, and uh, it looked real good, Troop. Thank you, Smokey. And hey. Smokey, you still there? Uh, yeah, uh, Jim, we've still got you for about another minute here. Okay, well, listen, I hope the whole world's listening, but I, I tell you, I think we've got the greatest set of flight controllers that we could have. There's any place that we could be found. Uh, I'd like to thank you all. I'm sure the rest of the guys up here would, too. Uh, Raj, uh, Spider, we, uh, we copy. Thank you very much. Spiker and McDivitt shortly will be climbing back into the command module, and then they will cut loose the very successful Grumman lunar module to uh, take off into a much higher orbit, firing its engines until depletion of fuel. The lower stage is circling the Earth at about 180, uh, 200 mile 
orbit, something like that, and we'll probably re-enter in about a uh, month's time. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 9 will continue in a moment. Does this look like a washing machine? Or a toaster? Or a steam iron? Or a refrigerator? Hardly. But some people are still confused about what we make. Western Electric is the manufacturing and supply unit in the Bell system. We're a part of it. What we do make is telephones. And much of what it takes to connect them together, like underground cable, and to send your calls leaping through the air, microwave radio relay systems. And complex equipment that finds the number you dial. Western Electric makes this for your Bell Telephone Company and the other Bell Telephone Companies across the land. Because we're with them in the Bell system to help bring you dependable, low-cost communication service. Does this look like a refrigerator? CBS News coverage of the flight of Apollo 9 continues after this pause for station identification. This is CBS. CBS News coverage of the flight of Apollo 9 is brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell system. And now back to Walter Cronkite. Eight years ago, the United States space program committed itself to a plan for landing a man on the moon, which involved sending a spaceship uh, up to the moon, going into moon orbit, and then detaching a ferry ship to go from the moon orbiting mothership down to the surface of the moon and after ex exploration on the moon taking the astronauts back to the mothership in moon orbit and then coming home. Today, eight years later, that concept was proved out with the first manned flight of the Grumman Lunar Excursion Module which uh, Jim McDivitt and Rusty Schweikert have just flown for six hours, tested all of its systems, proved out that it uh, can indeed go to the moon's surface, get off again, and re-rendezvous with a mother ship. Scott McLeod uh, is a test astronaut for the Grumman Aircraft Engineering Company out at uh, Bethpage, Long Island. He's been helping us out uh, through this flight uh, in a mock-up of the lunar module with our CBS News correspondent, Steve Rowan. Scott. Uh, through this whole six hours of maneuvering today, uh, you've been following each of the maneuvers uh, as you have been training with the astronauts on those maneuvers. How do you think it all went? Oh, we're happy as a clam, Walter. Uh, everything went very successful, and I think we proved all of the work that has gone on for the past years. Was there any point of the flight, uh, Scott, that, uh, that uh, in its actual execution today seemed hairier than had been anticipated? No, I don't believe so. I think everything went uh, pretty well according to plan and according to schedule. I th probably the only differences were the flight planning, as Steve and I had been discussing earlier. Walter, you noticed perhaps uh, in mm -hmm. the <clears throat> rendezvous maneuvers that they were actually about five miles or so below what the flight plan said uh, in the land, but then the command module was in a different place too, uh, wasn't it, Scotty? Yes, I think the... Oh, the difference there is because of the real-time flight planning in that what they're interested in doing is the burns of the descent, the ascent engine, and the RCS maneuvers, and not necessarily hitting a specific point in space, <coughs> excuse me, except for that point when they come back to the command module. The LEM uh, crew then doesn't really worry about where it is in relationship to the Earth. No. No, just the heat shield. Scotty, you've got a little hoarseness from being on oxygen so long during this flight? <laughs> I guess so, yes. That seems to be a trouble that plagues the astronauts as they breathe that uh, 
pure oxygen environment in space. Scott, thank you very much for your help on this flight and on the future flights of uh, the uh, Apollo 10 and Apollo 11 when they do land on the moon. Uh, we expect to see you climb out of that uh, LAM simulator out there at uh, Grumman and actually uh, take a walk on the moon's surface for us. We'll work out something of that kind anyway, you can be sure, before July and we get to the moon. Thank you, Walter. Scott McLeod, you've been great. Thanks very much. Thank you. And out of Downey, California, where they build the command module, which has proved out so well, now in uh, three flights of the uh, Apollo program. Uh, this is the Apollo 9. Uh, Leo Krupp is the test astronaut for North American Rockwell. And Leo, uh, it looked like it went mighty well up to now, hasn't it? Certainly has, Walter, and it was very nice to have the whole orchestra together for a change, and I thought the music that the lunar module and the command module played was certainly beautiful. You're getting poetic, Leo. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I think space flight uh, perhaps inspires that in men, and particularly those of you who work so closely with the program and indeed are the program for uh, manned flight. Uh, Leo, does that, uh, does that little dock uh, latching indicator problem uh, give you any concern for the future? Uh, no, sir. I think that was probably just a case of, of Dave not holding the switch to the extend release long enough. Uh, so he pushed the he pushed the limb away, but he came off of the switch before the, the limb actually separated, so the docking latches were still holding the two vehicles together. And the fact that he was able to get it back in the right configuration leads me to believe this was the problem. So I'm sure that won't happen again. They all understand that even though that closing rate is uh, at around 15 hundredths of a mile per hour, which is mighty slow, uh, there's still a pretty good jolt when the two spacecraft come together. Well, there is a little disturbance, especially when the vehicles are light like they are now. Now, in the transposition and docking, the, uh, the S-4B was attached, and we had a very heavy vehicle, so we didn't have too much. But now it's like two very light uh, sports cars coming together, so you will get a little disturbance. But uh, as soon as he makes contact, pardon? I didn't say anything. As soon as they make contact, uh, McDivitt would go ahead and thrust on in to keep the probe from bouncing out to make sure he pushes it into the funnel get a capture latch, which he did very nicely. Well, thanks a lot, Leo Krupp and Terry Drinkwater there riding with you in the mock-up command module. We'll be seeing more of you, of course, uh, as uh, the spacecraft comes back to Earth uh, later on uh, uh, early next week, I should say, in five more days. Now they will fire the ascent engine of the uh, lunar module, send it off into a high orbit, uh, a little later on as they detach it from the command module and continue the very successful flight of Apollo 9. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News Space Center, New York. This has been a CBS News special report, the flight of Apollo 9, brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of our continuing coverage of important news events. Next Apollo update on the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite.